All right, well, welcome everyone. I am Dr. Michelle Villagran. I am with San Jose State University, the chair of the College of Professional and Global Education Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And I wanted to welcome you to our inaugural 2021 uh, EDI and Social Justice Webinar Series. And I'm very excited. This series really focuses on providing our college academic units, our faculty, students, staff, and affiliates with diverse topics, wonderful presenters that are going to share with us uh, professional development topics and those with which really tie in with the goals of inclusive excellence, EDI, which are really core to our uh, mission of our committee. Now, first, just a few housekeeping, and then I'll turn it over to our presenter. If you have any questions during the session, please place them in the Q&A. We'll use the Q&A feature for questions. Uh, our presenter also will address these. She has a pause in between and then also at the end. So there'll be ample opportunity to answer questions. We will engage in a technique used to give marginalized groups a greater chance to speak. So if you identify as a marginalized group, just place an asterisk prior to your question. And we'll address those questions first, depending on the number of questions we have. If you wanna chat with one another or just offer comments in the chat, uh, please use the chat box. So questions in Q&A and chatting in the chat box. You will need to select all attendees and panelists in the carrot drop down. Otherwise, your chatting comments will only come to the panelists. And we will be monitoring both the Q&A and chat, chat throughout the session. Now, this session is being recorded and will be made available on the College of Professional Global Education YouTube channel. And I'll provide that link in just a moment in the chat for you. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. We will be adding a diversity playlist, so you'll be able to see all of the webinars in one place. And then also upcoming webinars for 2021 will be included on the CPGE events page, and I'll share that link as well. A special thank you to the College of Professional and Global Education, the marketing team, as well as the EDI committee. So without further ado, I will now introduce our speaker for today. Angela Bloom, uh, analyst for the Educator Advancement Council in Oregon Department of Education will be sharing with us tools for centering racial equity and data processes. So Angela, I will turn it over to you. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to be invited here to talk about something that is so important. Um, I was honored to be asked here by Michelle to give an overview of ways we can forward our work in undoing structural racism and data. And I am so humbled to be among colleagues that are bravely tackling this very timely and challenging work. So I'm going to be walking you through some examples of data from California and Oregon and introducing a toolkit produced by the Actionable Intelligence for Social Policy Group. Um, I'll be referring to them as AISP. And the toolkit's called Centering Racial Equity Throughout Data Integration. So while I understand everyone is located in different places, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land San Jose occupies and the surrounding region. So the San Jose State uh, University community recognizes that the present day Mwekba Ohlone tribe is comprised of all of the known surviving American Indian lineage, lineages Aboriginal to the San Francisco Bay region who trace their ancestry through the missions Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores during the advent of the Hispano-European empire into Alta California and who are the successors and living members of the sovereign, historic, previously federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County. The San Jose State University community also recognizes the importance of this land to the indigenous Muecla Ohlone people of this region. And consistent with our principles of community and diversity, strives to be good stores on behalf of the Muecla Ohlone tribe whose land we occupy. So I wanted to open up with this quote I heard some months back. If we give people skills and tools 
without dealing with racism. We make them a more skillful racist. So this is your first opportunity to interact. Um, I was wondering if you would mind dropping into chat. Um, what do you think of this statement? And I'm gonna have to rely on Michelle to check chat for me since I can't see it as a presenter. We'll give you a moment. Remember to check all panelists and attendees in the chat box at the bottom. Uh, call to action. Yeah, it's um, definitely early in the talk to be asking this of you. So I'm going to move forward. And thank you for that, whoever did make a comment. Um, so this quote was by Ron Chisholm, who's known for his lectures and work called Undoing Racism. And I would ask or maybe comment that what is data if not a tool? So I want to tell you a little bit about my journey with data equity as context for this conversation. So when I came to work for the state of Oregon, after working in education administration, I helped build the business case for the statewide longitudinal data system. So that's when I really took a deep dive into data policy. And as the launch of the SLDS grew near, my role was highly focused on building policy and processes for public and government use of the SLDS. So with this came the realization that we needed a more structured approach to our process of data sharing, both within the state and with the public, so as my search for best practices in data sharing and integration intensified, I began to see new terminology, data democracy, data ethics. I also began to realize how far behind the US is in producing public policy around data privacy, security, and ethical considerations of data. So it was clear to me there was some urgency in building understanding among our executive staff about creating better data policy before we launched this massive tool. So I teamed with a political science intern and we researched, produced, and presented a brief on data ethics to the heads of the Department of Education, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, the Employment Department, and Oregon's Chief Data Officer. So while the concept of producing more policy around data ethics met with support with this group, the need for more evidence of best practices was clear. So my search for an authoritative data source on data ethics only was yielding me results from overseas. So I eventually broadened my search to data equity, which I considered part of data ethics and got connected with Eileen Bergman from the Annie Casey Foundation. So that work led me to AISP, who has been leading work across the nation in best practices and building integrated data systems for many, many years. The Annie Casey Foundation was interested in the same things AISP and I were, were, and that was finding expertise in data ethics and data equity. So the Annie Casey Foundation ended up funding AISP to pursue this search for expertise, and we're all looking for experts. And what we found is on this slide, none of us could find an expert. So there's pilot projects happening and work in action testing the waters, but we couldn't find any exemplars of mature work. So the solution was to put together experts in parts of the work and best thinkers to build a toolkit and then we'll get it out to the public. So I'll be referencing some of our findings and examples from the toolkit as we go forward. So as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna to try to give some room for discussion because I think it's really important for learning um, so I built in a pause and Michelle mentioned that, and she's gonna help us by watching for raised hands and checking the Q&A. So my hope for today is that we'll have it, um, an understanding of where structural racism shows up in data and why it matters. We'll understand the risks and benefits of data and data integration and use from a community perspective. And we'll have a starting place for addressing structural racism in data. So I want to spend a couple of minutes making a distinction about the type of data we're talking about today. So this is administrative data. And administrative data is data not collected for research purposes. So examples are um, student counts and number of uh, people in unemployment and the average salaries of workers across different sectors. So this is uh, often cyclically collected and reported. 
So this is an example of how you might see administrative data used. This is a chart from a report put out by the Public Policy Institute of California. And it looks at student access for first time stu uh, English students. So if you look at the source note, you'll see this data was pulled from COMIS, which is California Community College Student Longitudinal Database. Uh, the database used for this chart includes things like enrollment and demographic data. So as it stands, these are the categories of students considered in the bar graph we just saw. This is also a good example of the limitations of administrative data. So do you think these categories tell the whole story of who our first time English uh, learners are? Probably not. Are these the labels we'd use to describe groups of people in our community? Probably not. There is likely an NA group of folks in this data set that doesn't show up here. So folks who didn't find a category that really described them on the intake form, so they left it blank. Or maybe they clicked more than one category and the administration picked the first category they selected because the system wasn't built with a multiracial category. Or maybe even they didn't feel safe answering the question about race and ethnicity and were afraid that some harm might come to them if they disclosed it. So now we know what administrative data is. I wanna read a passage from the toolkit and it's one I'm gonna come back to. Data sharing and data integration involve significant privacy risks and all data we use should be carefully considered to ensure it's legal, ethical, and with a purpose that can be linked to action to improve outcomes. Okay, so data is complicated and this is not a surprise to anybody in the Zoom, but I wanna describe why it's complicated. So to describe a real thing, we use proxies. In the Oregon education system, when we wanna look at poverty, we look at free and reduced lunch as a proxy for, for poverty. Data represents a snapshot of a single thing that doesn't tell us anything about the lived experience of that thing. Data can describe a problem, but it can't solve the problem. Data quality varies. Uh, administrative data are not collected for research, creating a data quality problem when it's used for research. It might be missing documentation or missing data that calls into question the reliability and validity of the data. So assumptions made about interpretation, about the interpretation of data labels can corrupt the results. And we become mechanical in our use of data. I imagine most of you have heard the term data-driven decision-making. We collect data with the intention of gathering information to help us make decisions. We collect data to tell us how many people visited our website, how much we earned in a day, how many people clicked like on our Facebook post. So data use is wide and our ability to collect more is growing every single day. We collect data all the time. What we don't do as often is ask ourselves if the community of people we're gathering data from is getting anything of value back from our data. Even more important, we don't ask ourselves very often if there's any harm caused by our data. So when does data cause harm? Data is not race neutral. Every data collection is the result of decisions and choices. At every place inside the data lifecycle, decisions are made that affect what is collected, how it's collected, what it's used for, how it's labeled, what's included and what is excluded. Decisions creating racially biased data cascade and harm can be amplified. So I like this example provided by Shingai Minjengwa in a presentation about removing bias and building trust in your data. So I'm gonna pop over to this video. On to the last example, I believe. So even as someone who works in data and analytics and in data science education, I am not immune <laughs> to being affected by bias in data. So I've shared this photograph before in different settings, but I'll, I'll, I just thought it would be a good idea to share it here. So I was in Germany at uh, a Centers of Excellence um, facility. Um, and as we walked in, there was an artificial intelligence uh, engine uh, sitting behind a screen that would approximate your age and your gender um, based on your appearance. And as soon as I walked in, 
the artificial intelligence didn't recognize me at all, but it did recognize my other colleagues standing to my left and standing to my right, and even my colleagues behind me who all happened to be light-skinned. So, bias or no bias? And maybe start to think about why and how this happened. So on that one, I'll just quick, jump quickly to the reason uh, that we believe it's the training data. So when this artificial intelligence engine was trained, it was only trained on people that had much lighter skin tones than my own, such that when I walked into the room, this engine didn't recognize me at all. Now, this was a fun demonstrative exercise. However, imagine if this was the same artificial intelligence engine in a driverless car. If I was attempting to cross the road, the same technology wouldn't be able to see me and we would have quite negative consequences. So bias or no bias? Okay. So holding on to the view that data is race neutral replicates structural racism. And that's a pretty heavy statement and I wanna check in with you. Um, so what are you thinking right now can you drop a comment into the chat? And it could be anything from, hey, you're crazy. Well, you just rocked my world. What's the question again? I was sleeping. It doesn't matter. Just um, I was trying to get a knee jerk reaction. So what do you think about that statement? You can go ahead and place it in the chat. There's a few comments from earlier, um, but we'll see if anybody has comments uh, related to how they're feeling now. I want to recognize that this is this is tough stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we yeah we have um, shocking to me. Um, it is true from my experience. Um, so important to call this in. This is so important to remember, especially when talking about law enforcement reforms. Yes. Uh, AI and bias is a very real concern and it makes sense to me. Yeah, great. Um, so this is resonating, that's great because uh, it's. we'll have some more examples later of um, how this keeps showing up. And it's not gonna go away because we're gonna keep using data, um, but we do have some ways to look at how we could start mitigating some of this, um, this damage. So what questions do we need to ask ourselves to reorient our work? So the lowest threshold is, is it legal? Um, does this meet our legal and policy requirements? A better threshold is, is this eth ethical? So do we have governance structures in place to support or determine data use? Are we using best and promising practices in data collection? Do we make decisions within the limitations of our data? And here's the best threshold. Is it a good idea? Are we solving a problem? Are there unintended consequences to using this data? So I wanna demonstrate why thresholds are so important. Most of us are familiar with the census. We just completed the 2020 census. So our previous federal administration proposed to include a citizenship question on the census. The proposal suggested that it would help enforce the Voting Rights Act protecting minorities from discrimination. So does this meet our legal threshold? Yeah, it's legal to propose changes to the census providing that the change is enacted through the proper procedures. So that gets a green check. Uh, does this meet our ethical threshold? Well, there are governance structures that oversee both the administration and use of census data. Census data, uh, the, the process of collection is protected by federal law. Um, and federal law also assures us that our census data is gonna be completely confidential. So, okay, sure, this meets our ethical threshold. Does this meet our highest threshold? Is it a good idea? Well, protecting minorities from discrimination sounds pretty good. Protecting voting sounds pretty good. So why did Japanese Americans speak out against this proposal? Members of the Japanese American community remember that in 1942, Census data was used to track down Japanese Americans living in the US and imprison them. There were protections in place on the confidentiality of census data, but an act of Congress called the Second War Powers Act suspended confidentiality. If we were to ask members of our black, indigenous, Latinx, Asian community if this was a good idea, what would they say? 
would they say this new, new piece of data is going to protect them? So thinking about our thresholds, um, it's helpful to use a tool like a, a benefit risk matrix to talk through intended and unintended consequences of data use. So here's a tool. Um, here in the green box would be data that's low risk, high benefit. And the yellow boxes, this is data that's either low benefit and low risk or high benefit and high risk. And the red box is data that's low benefit and high risk. So this is a great exercise to do with a variety of perspectives. And we're gonna practice this. So ideally you'd be doing this with others in a group, um, but since we're doing this virtually without breakout rooms, I'm gonna ask you to take three minutes to think through this individually. So we're gonna look at these three examples of civic data use. Program evaluation with longitudinal outcomes. So this might be something like that study we saw looking at how many first time English learners are registered for college between 2015 and 2019. Open data initiative, initiatives that publish aggregate data sets. So this would be like our example of the census. And then predictive analytics and policing and somebody referenced this earlier. Predictive analytics for anybody who doesn't know is uh, the use of historic patterns in data to predict something that takes place in the future. Okay, so three minutes starts right now. And just to give you a heads up, we're going to have a poll. So write down your answers if you don't remember them. There's about one minute left. Okay, we're gonna wrap those thoughts up and I'm gonna have Michelle bring up a poll for us. So if you could just put your answers down on the poll, we'll see where everybody landed. And I will say here, all three of the um items you were looking at, there's three questions in the poll. Yeah, don't forget to scroll down. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Results are coming in, but we'll leave it open um, 
for at least a minute, I think, Angela, or a minute and a half. Yeah, uh, it looks like we're going up pretty quickly here. We spent, um, so when we did this with the work group, uh, we spent half a day doing this. So I'm asking a lot of you in a very short amount of time. So if you're not sure, um, take your best guess. And how about 30 more seconds for the poll? So it looks, it's looking good. Okay, um, do you want me to go ahead and end it? Yeah, go ahead. And then I'll share the results. Um, and Angela, I don't know, can you see the results? If not, I can read them. Uh, I can see the, the red bars, which I'm guessing are the winners here. Um, so it looks like program evaluation uh, with longitudinal outcomes. Most people think that's in category one, high benefit, low risk. Um, our second one is open data initiatives. And it looks like people think that is category two, high benefit, high risk. And predictive analytics and policing. Um, it looks like most folks uh, agree that that's low benefit, high risk. Yeah, and the last one, overwhelmingly, 71% chose uh, low benefit, high risk. There we go. Um, and this is pretty indicative, I think, of how things usually go with this, where some things seem pretty clear and other things, it's kind of foggy and it takes some time to work through. So let's take a look at how the our, our group lines up with the AISP work group and, and the exercise as we went through it. So this is an example of uh, the different pieces of our work um, from all these different sectors and, and walking through this risk benefit matrix. And it includes our three practice questions. So the program evaluation for longitudinal outcomes, uh, this mapped out as high benefit, low risk. So good, congratulations. Um, we have done this for state funded initiatives quite a bit. Um, so like tracking a variety and presence of CTE programs after a targeted investment. Open data initiatives that publish aggregate data sets. This one's a little tougher. So this shows up for us in low risk and low benefit because privacy laws and other influences limit how disaggregated we can make these. So it protects individual identities, but it also makes the data less specific, creating more difficult conditions to make informed decisions about the results. Predictive analytics and policing. I think most of us agreed on this one. Um, this has been in the news a lot. Technologies being used in everything from predict predicting behaviors to influencing verdicts by judges. Uh, one of the members of the work group led an effort in Detroit to stop facial recognition software from being used in traffic cameras as part of policing efforts. If we think back to the video example, it's easy to imagine how a system like this might cause more harm than good. If the city of Detroit had considered the benefits versus costs of installing a system like that in collaboration with the community, I wonder if it had ever gotten off the ground. So now that we've done that practice, I'd love to take a few minutes um, and just hear from you what your thoughts are on what we've covered so far and any questions um, or comments or just ponderings um, and I'm going to ask Michelle to help me out again, since I'm not able to see comments or the question and answer. So there's been a lot of really rich uh, comments and sharing of resources within the chat prior. Um, while everyone's thinking about additional thoughts or questions or comments, I'll read some of those. Great. Um, just to ensure we cover every comment and I don't miss anyone. Um, just going back to at the very beginning when you had that uh, that statement and what uh, you know the call to action, uh, there was you know it's assuming all people are racist is that the contention? Thinking about what's happening lately with Google's DNI failures and firing a top black scientist, it seems pretty accurate. 
um, this is something I not thought of before, a call to remember that by ignoring something, it does not make it go away. Uh, the resource, uh, and this is actually a really great book, I also recommend it. So you wanna talk about race, um, which really includes the understanding of the definition of racism. And it's not about individuals and where you see blatant examples of racism, but the inequity and discrimination built into systems that are based mm -hmm. on race. Yes. So makes complete sense. Uh, the video was shocking. I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, the video also goes along with the lines of the Black Lives Matter and the fact that even the artificial intelligence did not notice a dark person. Yep. Um, really great examples of how systemic, systemic racism is in data. Oh, there's just a ton of stuff here. Um, Good. So I, I think I'm hearing a common theme here. And by the way, I can tell there's a lot of really great minds in the room. These are great comments. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge that something that we're getting at here is that we have systems that there, there's a difference between overt racism and covert racism. And what we're really talking about here is a lot of covert racism. There are places that it's embedded in the system that we don't necessarily see right off the top. Um, when I showed you that graph, you wouldn't have immediately gone to that's racist. Um, it's, and it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not that the, the people who produced the graph or even the data set had any intentions of being racist, but there's a lot of this, um, there, there's a lot of cultural indoctrination involved here where this is just the way we do things and we don't question why. And that's where this covert racism shows up. And I think that's what I'm seeing in your comments is that recognition, which is great. So I'm gonna move forward and we'll have a chance to stop and, and talk about this a little more. Um, at near the end. So I, let's talk about the data life cycle. Um, and you'll probably have seen some variation of this at some point if you spent any time with data. Um, so it's planning, data collection, data access, use of algorithms and statistical tools, data analysis and reporting and dissemination. So this is kind of an ideal version of this life cycle. And you'll see variations of this sucker that bounce all over the place. And in my experience at the state, I might also add to this list uh, policy and lawmaking. So policy and laws are sometimes created because of a data set to produce a new data set or to study a data set. So the question is, where do we center racial equity in the data life cycle? And the answer is everywhere. At every step in the data life cycle, we should be centering racial equity. So there's a really there's a lot to cover <laughs> in all the areas of data the data life cycle. So I'm just going to hit some highlights. Um, so if we center our racial equity lens on planning, we start by asking ourselves these critical questions: Why is the work necessary? Who does the work benefit? How does this benefit the community at large? And who can the process or product harm? So planning should identify opportunities for positive practices, such as researching, understanding, and dismantling, or just sorry, disseminating the history of local policies and systems and structures, including past harms and future opportunities. We should take the opportunity to repair trust by acknowledging past harms. Building data literacy among organizations and community members. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, data walks and participatory action research. One of my colleagues in Baltimore, Bridget Blount, directs Baltimore's Promise, who collects city data and then uses it to redirect resources to neighborhoods most in need. Uh, they've opened the door to the community and invited them into the data governance structures and through data walks where the community can come in, see what data has been collected and what the city believes are the results of that data and influence the outcomes of the decisions made within the data. And then an example of participatory action research, so is in Broward County, Florida, and the Broward County Data Collaborative created a framework that invited community members to the table by co-constructing data governance and then teaching the community to research its own data and then co-creating solutions to community struggles. So this approach starts to address the social gaps 
that are common in research and data governance, which are very white dominated fields. So we also wanna avoid prob problematic practices, such as using only historic administrative data to describe the problem without a clear plan of action to improve outcomes. Failing to manage expectations around what the data are capable of telling or how long it will take to see marked changes in data action and outcomes. This is something that Oregon's tackling a lot right now. Providing insufficient data labels or inconsistent categories across data sets. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in Oregon, our schools collect race data based on the requirements of federal reporting. And I believe that's the same in California. So these are very limited categories. And because Oregon is over 85% white, there are communities where there are so few folks of color that they show up as an asterisk in our data. Our data don't reflect the real diversity of our communities. However, we rely on this administrative data to produce reports that help us direct funds and restructure law and policies. If we were to look back at our example from California Community College data, we would remember how limited those categories of students were. Who are we missing from that picture? So the next part of the data life cycle we're gonna look at is access. So access to data starts with practical and legal considerations. Open data is important for transparency and accountability. From there, the determination has to take into account whether data sharing protects or harms. We restrict and regulate um, data that has the potential to harm and share it with caution for high benefit projects. Some data should not be shared because it's sensitive, it's protected by law, or because it's not good quality data and won't result in good analysis or reporting. So we talked about privacy laws and most of our public bodies who hold data have suppression rules that require really small cell sizes are suppressed to make sure that data isn't backward identifiable to an individual. We know that the more we integrate a data set across different sectors, so for example, employment and education, the easier it is to backward identify somebody. We also know that in order to see our communities of color, we have to disaggregate our data. And the more we disaggregate, the clearer our picture is of who is and who is not represented in our data. So are you feeling the tension there? So I'm gonna ask you a question or rather three questions. Um, and I'm gonna to have to rely on Michelle again to check the Q and A or the, the comments. So how do we represent black and brown folks in data without making it possible to backward identify them? How do we uncover the hidden communities of color in our data without creating unintended consequences for them? How do we make sure that the benefit outweighs the risk? And again, I wanna acknowledge th these are really tough questions. I'll give you a, a few minutes. Um, there's one comment for question one, laughs in privacy scholar uh, with, with asterisks around it. So there's a laugh around it. <laughs> uh, go ahead and place them in the chat and I will read those as they come in. And while we're waiting for you to ponder your thoughts on these three questions, um, I will just mention a couple comments also from earlier, which I think are really important to to share. Uh, someone mentioned, um, I think people have a hard time separating the notion of racism as a personal failing, a moral flaw, and a systemic issue they perpetuate, whether unintentionally or not. Uh, and also that uh, earlier, this reminded an individual uh, of the saying that raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. um, a question, uh, racist is a term. So do we need to establish the meaning of the term before asking a question like, uh, like the earlier questions? And then we would all be on the same page. Um, what's the earlier question that we were, I guess that would be 
think it's your past. Racist or racism? So I, I, I think- Referring to uh, racist, but I think- uh, Racist practices. Right. So uh, I think one thing that um, we have to have some context for is that we live in a culture that's, that's a white dominant culture. And I, 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 I know you can't see my picture, but I am actually white. Um, and I recognize that there's some privilege associated with that because I grew up in a culture that aligns with, with the, the color of my skin. And there are practices that I grew up with that were not conscious practices, but that were still racist practices. And I acknowledge that and I'm working every day to undo those things. And I, I think when we're talking about racism, um, in this case, we're talking about racism and data and how that shows up. And a lot of that is the unconscious practices that come forward with um, folks who are working in data that aren't actively trying to uncover their own biases and understand the context that they live in. And that's, that's what I'm trying to call attention to. So I realize that there's a lot of different dimensions to this and there's a lot of ways that this lives in our communities. Um, and we could probably, I mean, this is a whole series. So <laughs> no doubt there'll be more parts of that that are addressed going forward. But for our purposes today, we're talking about covert racism that exists because we haven't spent enough time working on uncovering where this, th there's a set of policies, practices, and laws in place in, in throughout the country that have perpetuated this. And we haven't spent a lot of time looking back at why those things were created and then trying to undo them, undo the structures that continue this um, in a very subtle way throughout, and maybe not so subtle for folks of color, but um, you know, through all of our systems and at the government level, you know, I see this play out every day in, um, you know, when we produ we're producing policies and the, you know, legislators are leaning on these reports produced by um, our, our data collections, they're leaning on this information that's really flawed. And so that leads to kind of flawed decision-making in creating policies. And that's what we're trying to address and uncover. So I hope that starts to answer some of those questions. And there's a few, uh, I'll go back to your three questions on the screen. Um, there's a, a comment and then there is a question. Uh, so the first comment, in all seriousness, the more auxiliary data that becomes available, the harder it will be to be, oh, to, be to ensure data isn't re-identifiable, especially for marginalized populations for whom there are so many potential proxies. It's an urgent problem that needs a lot of work. Absolutely, yeah. So I actually don't have answers to these questions that I posed you. So I kind of tricked you a little bit, <laughs> but it, it's it's a, a struggle. It's a real struggle to um, address the two sides of the issue here, which are, you know, we want to acknowledge, we want to acknowledge that there are folks of color in our communities that are having, they're experiencing things differently than the rest of us are experiencing, the rest of us being, you know, uh, my, my community of white people. Um, and how do we, how does that show up if at the same time we're trying to protect those communities from these well-intentioned efforts to fix them? And it's, it's something that does, that is urgent and does require thought and, and process and time. And I think we're gonna, as we go forward in the presentation, we're gonna start hitting some more tools to do that. And I think that was one of the struggles that we really hit when thinking about data and equity and data is there wasn't a lot of tools to do this. Lots of people knew it was important, but we just didn't know how to do it. So um, I'm gonna move forward in our presentation and there'll be another chance to talk through this um, down the road, but I'm hoping we'll start to, to uncover some of that. Angela, can we pause though? There is one- We can. Well it's actually uh, two questions that relate to question one you had on the screen. And it looks like at least three individuals have the same question. Oh, sure. So for question one here, uh, does this relate, uh, would question one relate to data access? Who would be backward identifying people and why if we're thinking of data access? Yeah, so this is not just access, but um, sometimes it's the reports that we produce that become publicly available. Um, and I'll give you an example. So um, in Oregon, we produce reports on districts, individual districts, and sometimes we're targeting specific things. So 
if we were to say, um, if we were to look at, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this in the future here, but if we were gonna look at discipline data and we look at a particular district and we could see that um, there are black and brown folks in that district, students that are, um, they, they are on the discipline records. We see them show up more often than, than white students. So we know that that's an issue. Um, and what if there were only, let's say six or seven um, black or brown folks in that district? So even though it's a public report and the, their identities aren't on there, we know that there's only, <laughs> any, anybody in that district will know probably who those students are. And if we're saying that they're showing up in discipline data, we've just created unintended consequences for those students who now have their peers looking at them, wondering which one is it that has been, you know, to the principal's office four times this year. So it, it, I think it, it's both. So it's not just access to the data, but it's also how the data shows up in our use of the data um, that we need to think about. Thank you. I think that helped address the question. I will Great. let you continue on. Okay. And you'll have a chance to ask again if I didn't answer that correctly at the end. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to be cool now, take us slightly off course. Uh, I want to just explain the distinction between algorithms and machine learning. And the toolkit doesn't really do this, but uh, I think it's important. And if there's an expert in the Zoominar, um, please be gentle with me. Um, I guess this is not my expertise. But um, algorithms, so algorithms are a set of automated instructions. So some of you might remember having like TI-85 calculators or TI-82 calculator. In my physics class in high school, I remember spending a lot of time hiding my calculator while I programmed it to play blackjack to pass the time. And the random number generator gives me a number. And if I hit the number one, it means hit. And I get another number to add to the first. If those numbers equal 21, that I get a win message. So I programmed my calculator to give me different responses based on what conditions were met. Machine learning is a set of algorithms and this is fed into, um, this is fed structured data to produce a specified outcome without being explicitly programmed how to arrive at that outcome. So there was this article in Forbes um, that talked about targets machine learning a man went into Target in Minneapolis and he angrily demanded to talk to a manager. His teenage daughter received a mailer from Target with coupons for baby clothes and cribs. And the manager had no idea what to say. A few days later, the manager called the man again to apologize. And the man admitted he had since had a conversation with his daughter and discovered she was in fact pregnant. It turns out that Target had been data mining baby registries and shopping habits, and the system learned there was a commonality in the shopping patterns of women that were expecting. So the man's daughter fit the profile of expectant mothers, and the machine then targeted her for a mailer. So no doubt this process had repercussions for the daughter in this story, but think back about the example of facial recognition software. So as with data, algorithms and machine learning are not race neutral. Algorithms and machine re learning reflect the biases of the folks that created them. So these are some guidelines to consider. Responsibility, create clear channels for communication about potential adverse impacts of algorithms and machine learning and name specific individuals tasked with addressing these impacts. Explainability, ensure that algorithmic decisions, machine learning and data-driven decision making can be explained to end users and stakeholders in non-technical terms. Accuracy, um, identify, log and explain sources of error and uncertainty so that intended and unintended consequences can be anticipated and planned for. Audibility, uh, enable third parties to monitor and evaluate algorithmic and machine learning decisions. And fairness, ensure that algorithmic and machine learning decisions do not uh, create discriminatory or unjust impacts. Okay, so 
this, in my opinion, is the sexiest part of the data life cycle. A little bit of my nerd showing here. Uh, this is where the magic happens in rolling up all the work of planning, collecting, and processing, and discovering what we can learn from it. So context, incorporating a racial equity lens during data analysis includes incorporating individual, community, political, and historic contexts of race to inform our analysis, our conclusions, and our recommendations. So relying solely on statistical outputs without the context will not lead us to insights, but rather assumptions that can create or replicate harm. So considerations, how do we recognize and honor the experience of folks who have been an asterisk in our data for years? How do we simultaneously protect them from unintended consequences of well-intentioned efforts to raise them and their experiences up to the attention of policymakers and authorities? How do we simultaneously prevent over surveillance of black and brown bodies with our well-intentioned efforts to elevate what we see as the problems our community of color navigate. So I'll give you an example, and I, I mentioned this before, of systemic racism in education, and that's the discipline data. So black and brown folks, not just in our state, but in um, throughout the country are overrepresented. And research tells us that bias plays in to who gets targeted for discipline. So if we're making decisions based on that incomplete information, using only the data to build solutions without the context of the limitations of that data and the lived experiences of those students on the ground, we're gonna leave critical information off the table. So how do we start to get more information? Stakeholder engagement. It's a complicated business to center equity in data analysis with so many considerations to give us context. Strong participation from a variety of stakeholders is what enables our analysis to bring multiple perspectives to interpretation. So when we talk about this, it's important that we make a distinction between feedback, collaboration, and co-construction. So feedback. Feedback signals to the community that we have a box to check. We don't have time, but we want you to feel like we care. Did we use the right words? Did we draw the right conclusions? And this is only slightly better if we share the results back to the community. Collaboration signals to the community that their opinions matter. We have thought about it. We thought about our stakeholders. We wanna hear community voice. We've given some time to prioritizing who we need to reach out to. We have an idea and we wanna know how you feel about it and what your experiences have been. Co-construction, this signals that the community is our partner. We recognize the strengths in our community and we're elevating those to build something that is place-based, asset-based and centered in the lived experience of the community. You've told us this is a problem. We have some expertise and resources. Let's build a solution together that will reflect our expertise and yours. A few years ago, um, the Chief Education Office in Oregon and the Oregon Department of Education did a set of community engagements around early warning systems. So an early warning system, and it's, it's not for earthquakes, I know some of you are thinking, it's, uh, it's a structure inside of the education system that looks at patterns or trigger behaviors and alerts um, schools that a student is exhibiting behaviors that are associated with disengagement from school. Um, so they might drop out or they might stop showing up. The engagements were centered on having conversations with parents and teachers and other education partners about how to structure responsive and appropriate early learning systems for the K-12 system. The team gathered a lot of information and something that community elevated was the idea that we were measuring the wrong thing. Why were we worried about kids on a bad trajectory? Shouldn't we measure good schools and find out what they're doing that's working? Shouldn't we be looking at students on a good trajectory and ask them what's helping them get there? So that message was heard, but then we moved forward without changing our plans based on this radical idea our community had come up with. We missed our opportunity to benefit from the assets in our community by being too focused on the deficits and not listening to our community. 
So is collaboration enough? If we give up our tight hold on power, could we co-construct a better plan? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are examples happening in New Zealand, North Carolina, Florida, Pennsylvania, and, and I'll give you some resources on these examples of communities sharing in the process of researching and um, giving context to their own data in the resources at the end of the presentation. So here are some other examples of positive and problematic, problematic practices that center or decenter racial equity. So using participatory action research to bring lived experiences into data analysis. So this is our example of Broward County. Engaging experts. So domain experts like agency staff and caseworkers, method experts like statisticians. This will ensure that the data model is appropriate to examine the research question in a local context. Um, disaggregating data and analyzing intersectional experiences. So this is like looking at race by gender because there's a lot of intersectionality that happens here. And some of the problematic practices that we wanna avoid is applying a one size fits all approach. What works in one place or one community may not work in another place. Using one dimensional data for decision-making such as using test scores without considering environmental factors like teacher turnover or student demographics. Analyzing data with no intent to drive action or change that benefits those being served. So there's a philanthropic organization in Chicago called Chicago Beyond that invests in organizations that provide opportunities for youth and they put out an equity series and volume one is called, Why Am I Always Being Researched? And the executive summary opens with a quote. If evidence matters, we must care how it gets made. There's a story in this series about a young man named Jonte. His question to researchers was, why am I always being researched? The story goes on to explain that his friends were part of three different studies all at the same time. A grandmother on his block remembers being in studies um, in her youth too. In this neighborhood and surrounding communities, decades of research had been done and millions of dollars had been spent doing this research and not much had changed for them. In fact, distrust has taken root between the community, the researchers who have gone into the community and funders who are paying for the research. So the paragraph after Jonte's story goes on to ask a powerful question. What if the structures we use to find what works to improve communities is negatively impacted by the same power dynamics that have propped up those systemic injustices? So this is a really complicated message and I'm gonna let you ponder it for a little bit. And while you're pondering that, I wonder if you would indulge me one more time as we're reaching the conclusion here um, and drop in some comments into the chat about what changes you might make in your considerations of data or what was something that you were hoping to hear about that I didn't cover today or an aha um, that you might've had while listening. And this is the promised resource folder that I um, said I would give you with uh, presentations, the toolkit, I, I've been referring to podcast articles um, and uh, my email's at the bottom. And I'd love to hear of other examples you run across from this work in action. So I'm gonna stick around for a few minutes and see what we've got in the chat and the questions. And I'm placing in the chat the bit.ly link, uh, your email, Angela, as well as the link to the CPGE YouTube channel uh, and then the link for our future webinars. Thank you. You're welcome. I have one comment while everybody's pondering uh, because I'm working on a, uh, I'm on a, a team project around legal responses uh, due to COVID-19 in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the whole AI component, um, Certainly in Latin America and the Caribbean, it's, it's much, I would say, much more different than in the United States or North America because of resources or lack thereof and even government control in certain countries. 
And in one specific country, they uh, put just like that video you showed, they had uh, these in the airports to uh, recognize that if you are high risk or low risk of COVID, they had these AI machines that would gather whatever type of information to assess your risk level if when you were entering or leaving the airports um, in this particular country, and I think several countries in Latin America, um, there's a lot of scrutiny in some countries because of privacy issues, uh, also what data was being collected, and then the government control piece. And I'm wondering in what you've shared today, and of course, because of you know marginalized groups and a lot of poverty in many of these countries, I'm wondering, based on what you shared today, if you've seen anything uh, specifically in the United States where uh, things where COVID has come into play, or if you've heard of you know use of these technologies and looking at the data and how COVID, um, if they're they're utilizing these high risk, low risk, or benefit a model like this to assess you know, an individual's risk and the types of data. I mean, we all know the apps and everything like that, but I don't know if you've heard of any airports or uh, AI technology that's being used in the United States, similar to what Latin America was using or is still using. Yeah, like uh, taking temperatures. I, I, I've heard of like uh, some cameras being installed that are supposed to take temperatures of folks in airports. Um, if that's what you meant by the high risk, low risk, if they have a high temperature, they're likely to be flagged for screening for COVID. I, I think some of the concerns with COVID is we put a lot of measures into place without a lot of um, process because it's an emergency and we're, you know, we're, we're trying to react to the emergency. And what happens is, is sometimes, you know, we put something into place um, and then it gets, we get down the road a little ways we never take it we never take it away and we just keep building whatever was put into place in the emergency into something that it wasn't intended to be in the first place so i, I think um that I, I can see like going forward we might end up with a few things like that um so i i know in and i'm very centered in in education in oregon so i, I use a lot of education examples but uh with you know as we move towards into distance learning during COVID, um, there's been a lot of privacy concerns brought up with students who, you know, um, they're coming on screen and they're they're being asked to keep their cameras on. In the meantime, you know, their house go, you know, the household goes on behind them and they've got, you can see into their house, you can see everything that's happening um, around them. Um, there's been all sorts of Zoom bombings where folks will come in that don't have anything to do with the classroom and expose students to things that they shouldn't be exposed to. Um, so I, I, I do think that we're gonna be navigating the um, effects of systems that were put in place during COVID for quite a few years come, to come. Um, a lot like what happened after 9-11 with Homeland Security mm -hmm. efforts, you know, they, they put some structures in place that continue to be utilized in ways that maybe aren't to everybody's, uh, not to everybody's advantage. Yeah, and these, the ones in Latin America were not only temperature they're collecting a lot of data about the individual so that's where mm. the privacy and you know and many of these um, individuals didn't have some responses to the questions that were being asked and of course governments involved um, but can you go back to the slide above uh, with the actual um, what well, wasn't a question more of the what you wanted them to respond to that one there's the question one? okay yes there we go for um, one of our individuals uh, in the audience. And there's a comment here. Uh, I'm taking classes where we learn a bit about machine learning ethics. Uh, the list you shared earlier was a key topic of discussion. Uh, then we do hands-on Python coding with some of the algorithms and libraries. And for me, there is a disconnect between those best practices and the reality of using these tools without deeper technical know-how, understanding, and applying the ethics is weirdly different. I think it will come with experience, but I wanted to acknowledge that the access to technical tools has maybe expanded beyond many folks' ability to manage and understand the ramifications of using it. I agree with that, that statement. Yeah, so I, I think this gets back to some um, comments I made earlier with, where 
you know, we are coming up with technology much faster than our policy can move. So we have new ways of collecting data and, and you know, we have a lot of, a, a lot of strength and work happening in um, programming and, and building new software and all sorts of, you know, driven by the market um, that we don't have the same um, sort of, we don't have the same things driving our policy changes. We don't have the same uh, attachment to economy, right? So we have a lot of companies that are interested in finding new ways to collect information on people, to market to them, to um, make healthcare, but, you know, uh, provide them with some new vitamins or, or medicines. We don't have that same impetus driving our policy making. So as we are developing these, these new um, data tools, the, our current policies aren't responsive to that. Um, and that is definitely a huge issue in the United States. Um, Europe has gone a little farther than us. They've, they've started to address these things. And I, I mentioned that I, a lot of the examples of, that talk about data ethics, forums and blogs, those exist outside of the United States. And I, I haven't seen as many of them here. And it, it's starting to take hold. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of movement here, but there's still definitely um, what you're describing is that, that lack uh, of understanding from the technical providers um, and, the, and the connection to the policymakers that, that there's not a clear understanding of how we're able to connect data when we're create or how we're able to create data when we're creating these policies. So how do you cover in a policy, you know, protections on data when you don't understand how they're being made? So I, I definitely agree with you. There, there's, a, there's a lack of, co of content knowledge there in data literacy in our policymakers. And then in the other direction, we have folks who are making these systems and building this that have gone through, you know, we don't, we don't include a lot of um, equity training in, you know, computer science and in colleges and universities. So, you know, there, there's a lot of folks that who are just um, creating what they can create because they're excited about being able to build something, a new system that does something different that nobody else has done before. And there isn't a lot of um, always oversight in what the implications of that system are, especially the ethical in implications for folks that you know, how it's going to play out on the ground, some mm -hmm. foresight. There's another comment, and I think this is uh, critical to point out too, about remembering the hoops that one might need to jump through in order to become a member of the academy or academia. So being first in the family, maybe to graduate with your bachelor's, being the first to have a graduate degree and uh, having the privilege of being able to afford both. But what about for individuals who can't find a way to be able to join that community. Uh, how do we hear those voices and collaborate? So I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. So we're talking about, um, is this when we're- First generation, um, those gaining access or becoming a part of uh, academia. And I know there's, you know, cultural, there's a lot of implications and challenges, but also it's an opportunity to welcome in um, those that might need more, I would say, support on the, on the uh, navigating the system, if you will, is just one aspect. Uh, but the question is what we can do to assist those folks to help them join the community and how uh, do we hear those voices and collaborate? And possibly, uh, Jordan, if you want to explain a little further in the chat, um, Angela can address uh, what you're looking for as it relates to uh, data as well as, uh, I would say, uh, racist tools or techniques we might be using. And someone to say it has to start there, diversity in academia and science, etc. And we need to both understand the technology and the ethics surrounding uh, these issues. Diversity in the actual builders of the system or systems. Yeah. I think we saw that a really good example of that with the training the artificial intelligence and why it was important to have some diversity in that group. So I, I think about, I'm thinking about Jordan's question and I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it, but I, I'm gonna try to tackle it here. Um, I, I think what you're asking is, you know, when we're looking at structuring um, entry into, into spaces like higher education, 
um, that entry looks different for different communities because some folks don't have the, the context or the background of having um, parents or family members who have been through the, um, the higher education system and don't, won't have that sort of background knowledge of how do you navigate entry into that. And I, I, I think it's um, a little, a little um, to the, of a side note in, in sort of this main conversation about data, but in terms of the, the structure to solve that, I, I think it's very similar in terms of um, there needs to be a, a general understanding of where those barriers are um, and, and I've seen this, like I was part of the hard, Higher Education Coordinating Commission in Oregon for a number of years. And I, you could see that this, um, this is a really common barrier. And the only way to address it is to step outside of the data and connect with the community that is experiencing that. And it might be a side-by-side -side approach where you, you're looking at the data to help you find which communities you need to talk to. And then you engage with the community and find out what the, what the barrier is. And that has to be something that the um, that academia in general tackles, knowing that the barrier is in play. And I think it's, at least I, I can speak for Oregon policymakers, is there's an understanding that there is a barrier there. And then how to tackle it is the part that's been kind of sitting out there in the ether, waiting for somebody to figure it out. And they are doing a much better job in the last few years of, of connecting with community members to start to figure out you know, is it that they can't, you know, they can't get information in their native language or is it that, um, you know, they're, I, I, this is a common thing with high school is if you're doing well in high school, you don't always see the counselor because the counselor <laughs> spends their time talking to somebody who's, who's not doing so well. And so folks who have the opportunity and, and they have the GPA that they need to get, get through that barrier, just they don't have any direction or anybody to guide them. So I think there's a that's a there's a lot of different things I could say about that, but I, I will say that I I still believe that the the answer to that that question is to that there needs to be some engagement at the high school and even middle school level on figuring out where where the stop is, where the stop and momentum is, um, or even considering whether um, you know academia is. And I might be crossing a line here, but um, whether you know going to higher education is the right move um, is we're seeing a lot of studies starting to come out now about um, higher education and you know um, the, the difference between you know salary increases and wealth increases, and for some groups that 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 doesn't always line up. Like the the promise of a higher wage it doesn't always line up um, with the increase of wealth based on your race and ethnicity. Um, and that's, that's a whole nother line of conversation, but um, one I just wanted to note. Thank you, Angela. Um, I think that answers um, the question to the extent we can right now, but feel free to email um, Angela directly and maybe you can have a side conversation for more tips or if there might be tools in her, her bit.ly resources for you. Are there any yeah. other questions? We did plan an hour and a half, so we will stay here at least until we cover you know, all comments and questions. Uh, but if you do need to leave, we do understand because it is past, you know, 15 past. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, go back to the toolkit. I know that this is a very um, surface level view of some really deep issues and um, I, I will say that the toolkit has a lot more depth in going into like if you if you are a data person and this was a little too surface level for you, there's a lot more tools in there, um, starting from planning all the way through implementation that that will be helpful. Wonderful, because I know several uh, asked for resources that they could take to you know share with their own organizations. Uh, so I think this this is fabulous. Yeah, and I'm there's there's other presentations in there, and I'm also totally open to you taking this presentation and sharing it with others. Um, this is not something that I do for a living. This is something I do because I'm passionate about it. So I I don't um, try to control where this information goes. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? I'm seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation and for the resources and the webinar. 
Well, that's great. Well, thank you for inviting me to come speak with you. It's been a pleasure to connect and hear all of your thoughts. Thank you, very informative. Uh, I really appreciate your time, Angela. And I mean, just on a whim and, and getting you and your expertise and involvement um, with this toolkit and the resources that uh, have been put together that you're willing to share with all of us at San Jose. So we appreciate your time and I think we'll conclude and then we'll get the recording um, out to everyone on the CPGE uh, YouTube channel. So be looking for that. And hopefully you've noted the bit.ly link and her email, which I'll put one more time in the chat. Thank you so much.